Our first speaker is, uh, is Professor Lisa, Lisa Gibbon from Swinburne University. Thank you. All right, trying to make my microphone go live. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, sorry, just getting this computer sorted. All right, good morning, everyone. I hope you're now well caffeinated and uh, something sweet inside to give us some energy for this session. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about, uh, you know, my reflections on work that I've been doing with some academics around how we engage with various publics, various community groups, and talk a little bit about some of the challenges from my perspective that academics are facing. So I'm really keen to see where the, the conversation takes us at the, at the end of our sessions. Um, just to give you a, a sense of my own background, I come from um, the land of information science, so my research is quite diverse, but at the heart of it I look at how people make use of technology. So I'm very interested in things like web apps and different tools, how people engage with, te with technology for various purposes. And I do work in a lot of different areas, a lot of different work contexts, uh, play contexts. And that brings me to working with people in very diverse areas, such as uh, pediatric, nursing, uh, the wine industry, I've worked in universities, I've worked with little kids playing with iPads, very, very diverse all around that context of how people actually make use of technology. And I've also had this stream of interest around research practice and how we actually do work, whether that's academics in unis or people working in practice environments. So I've done quite a number of workshops in this space and I've done some research in this space that I want to talk with you about today. Um, so that we can reflect a little bit on what's coming next as we look ahead to more engaged work and more formalized assessment in this space. So uh, societal research impact is certainly something that is reshaping the lives of our academics, uh, certainly just starting here in Australia. For some people, this doesn't change a thing. There are many of us who for decades have actually been doing this work. We've been out there in our communities. We've been uh, doing work that mixes theory plus practice. The big difference is around reward structures and the fact that other people are finally acknowledging the value of this structurally within a lot of our universities. Now, the double-edged sword, of course, means that we are facing a lot of extra work, a lot of different ways of thinking about this as we look ahead to how we assess these things. And so this bit of context that I've put onto this slide is just to give you this broad sense that this is part of a global movement. Um, we have a number of different countries worldwide that are now starting to assess academics in the way that they engage with the public, what that means for their research. Um, and a lot of this is bounded in the notion of our taxpayers getting good bang for their dollar. Um, and so there are a lot of different narratives, a lot of different pressures coming to bear, changes in granting structure, and yet we don't actually have a lot of research in this space that's still very much in, in the early stages and predominantly coming out of the UK because they're well ahead of us in some of these areas. Here in Australia, these are the definitions of research engagement and research impact um, that we are currently using. And I bring these to bear because um, we often talk about these terms in lay ways. We, we throw around the concepts of engagement. We talk about impact. What does it really mean? But getting an, our academics to actually understand the difference between engagement and impact, how to measure these activities in particular, how it can shape what they do in their work, is actually a much more challenging space than you might first uh, imagine. And the way that I explain it to people is I say, look, engagement is really all the outreach kind of stuff you do. You give a workshop for a group of people, uh, you do some uh, participatory development work with a group, that's an engagement activity. But did that group actually go away and is there a change in their behavior? Have they changed their practice because of what you did? That's impact. And until we see that change in behavior, what we might have is really great engagement, but actually no impact at all. And so that's a really interesting distinction. The, the other challenge, of course, is that research impact as a phrase has been around for a very long time, meaning academic impact, you know, is my work being cited? So I often use the phrase societal impact just to make clear that it's impact beyond academe is what we're talking about. But a lot of academics are not across this space. It's not something we're trained in. So it doesn't come naturally uh, to thinking in these different ways. Uh, shortly after I came to Australia, I, I received a grant um, from, the, from the government to actually start to look at 
were academics prepared for the engagement and impact type assessment that was going to come down the pipe? Now this was part of the discussion phase of this work where there was still some sense that maybe the government wouldn't go down this route. I kind of had a feeling that they would because there was so much work happening and because of what we'd seen in the UK. Um, but through this study, uh, which was predominantly qualitative in nature and also included a, um, an environmental scan of current research in this space, my general takeaways are that we still have this lack of a shared understanding of the definition of what this means, what the scope of this is. There are many challenges in how we measure this, and we have a huge need for academic institutional support for these activities that's not currently in place. So even though we hear lots of positive rhetoric often, or a lot of our institutions are very much promoting these kinds of activities, when we start to look at reward structures, for example, promotion guidelines worldwide, um, the proof is not yet in the pudding for many, many people. So there's certainly this changing nature to academic work, but for most academics, where this has previously sat, where it was counted, was in what's called the service bucket or the administrative bucket. So teaching, research, those two pieces were always front and foremost, often with higher percentages of workload attached to them. And where we were able to count this type of work was under service, which sometimes could only be 10%, 15, 20% of a person's work role. So there's no doubt that you know, a heightened emphasis on engagement and impact is going to be um, fabulous because it will give much more weight to these activities but this also means we need to be looking at our workload models, what are the things that we value, how might we count these things. Um, and we also have to really look carefully at professional development and PhD training. These are not things that are typically involved in, in this space. And in my day job as an Associate Dean of Research, I spend a lot of time you know, thinking about students, for example, who are very focused on their thesis work, and I'm really thinking about five years, ten years down the track, what are they going to be facing in this type of landscape. Um, you certainly can read lots and lots about community uh, or scholarly communication. This is another huge thread in the field of information science. We've studied this stuff nearly to death. Um, and we're the ones that created a lot of the metrics, journal impact factors, all of that. I always like to apologize at this point. Um, <laughs> they were never intended to be used for the dark purposes that they sometimes are. Um, but you know, we're masters at this. What we don't have currently is a lot of research about how we communicate with the public. We know lots about how academics communicate with each other, how different teams come together, um, but we don't have a lot of research that looks outward. So um, I often reference this, this blog uh, when I do a talk for anybody who's never encountered this type of space before. Um, why reinvent the wheel? The UK has gone down a lot of these paths, and this is one of the uh, best places if you want to learn more. They're also on Twitter. I find fabulous nuggets um, through that. But, but this wheel, which I've blatantly stolen um, from their website, really kind of maps for a lot of academics the way of thinking, right? This one little piece of the pie is the thing that's driven all of our reward structures for decades and decades, right? The knowledge, the academic impact of our work. And so all of our traditional measures around hiring, promotion, et cetera, have typically sat in that one bucket. These are then our approaches to measurement, you know, cart horse. If you've got a system that looks at a certain thing, you create tools in order to track those things. Um, so we have lots of databases, we have citation structures, we've got Scopus, we've got Google Scholar, we've got all these things, and we've got ranking systems that are entirely driven by journal metrics and various other metrics. These are often then sitting at complete odds with the notion of an impact and engagement agenda. And even as we talk about things like alt metrics, which lots of people think, oh, that's the saving grace, the problem is it's still a metric. And as a qualitative researcher, predominantly, that makes me nervous. It's not all about me metrics and quantifiable things. It's about what's the change in a person's life by this research. So in this new world, these are now the other potential pieces of the pie that academics can be playing in. The challenge is they've still got to be dealing with the academic piece. So it's not that we've removed things, we've simply now added another piece, and we've added it often in ways where we don't have a lot of supports in our unis um, to put underneath the activity. Let me give you a positive story just from my own research of what this kind of thing can look like. Um, so this is out of uh, an ARC linkage grant that I have with a colleague who works in the wine sciences. 
where we really wanted to look at the different information sharing strategies between researchers and wine makers, wine practitioners. This is a fun project, I get to taste a lot of wine. <laughs> um, brilliant idea. So one of the, we developed a number of sub-projects within this grant, and one of those was actually to um, do a, a large-scale user assessment and heuristic analysis of a website that they're literally putting thousands and thousands of dollars into uh, the government and uh, is, you know, has never been tested. Are users actually being served by this site? So we did this massive um, assessment for the group. This is what the site used to look like. And before we had even really finished the work, before we had delivered the report to them, they were already making changes. And what was at one level quite sad to me was that the design practices, they were kind of violating all the best practices that we already knew existed. We had tons of research on this, but they were hiring people with agriculture experience, not web design experience, not information architecture. So even though if you take a, a buzz through those key findings, this, these can look like simple things. It's too busy, we don't know what the purpose is, who's the audience. You know, those are the voices of the actual potential users saying, why would I even come to this thing? And you think of all the staff and all the time that was going into developing a thing that effectively was not being used effectively. Um, so this is a lovely story because it's the kind of thing that I can say, here's a direct impact of a work. It's not just engagement. It's not just me saying to the group, you should fix your site. They actually did it. Um, and that's gone on to change how they think about their staffing profiles and a variety of other, other pieces that I now need to be able to track and document for an exercise 10 years down the road to talk about the influence of my work. And that's where we get into the list of challenges, which is what I want to end on today. Um, th these are just you know, hitting the surface of the iceberg, as it were. There are lots of time lags that we have to deal with um, between when we do the work potentially, and, and when the work is, is resolved. My example happened to be while the grant's still ongoing, which is fantastic, but we know that m much of our research is not like that. It's also very difficult to measure. I'm very lucky that I have a partner investigator on the grant who is in government. A lot of the impact stories that I'm getting are through her because she's having hallway conversations. Without her there, how would I track this? How would I know what was going on? I keep saying to her, get them to send me an email, get them to send me something, and those things never materialize. Um, we don't have funding schemes for knowledge translation here in Australia. Currently, the only options, which I encourage, are to build things into existing grants. Um, countries like Canada, there are entire schemes for this stuff, so we're already lagging quite far behind. Um, we've got to have ongoing engagement, but even things as simple as our ethics approvals, our ethics reviews may not have accounted for that. So there's different ways to think about planning the project. Not all impact is direct. You know, some of these government people are now talking to other people in their departments about their own websites and helping them. And I'd love some credit for that. You know, not that I care about credit, but now, you know, if you know what I mean, but now I'm in a system that requires me to show evidence of my work. I need to know those stories. Um, so there's, there are a lot of challenges that we're faced with, and at the end of the day, we're not being trained in these areas. We're not preparing the next generation, and we're also not looking critically at our promotion and reward systems to ensure that we're actually matching up what we say we want and what we actually reward. On that note, I will hand over to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Associate Professor Catherine Althaus from the University of Melbourne. Thank you, Catherine. Good morning, everybody. I'd uh, just like to start by paying my respects and acknowledging the Wurundjeri people and their land and peoples uh, on the territory in which we're gathered here and are learning here today. Uh, my talk this morning is to give a little bit of a, um, a nudge towards a new way of thinking about evidence. So the title that I've picked is sort of like a bit of a play of, of the APO theme for today as well, in terms of that notion of redesign. But uh, one of the questions that I wanted to put to you is, to really think about uh, the fact that we are located in a unique place in the world which boasts 65,000 years worth of civilization, and if they don't know something about evidence and how to live well, then I don't know who does. 
So <coughs> I think it's a sort of a message for people to think about how can we tap into the unique knowledges um, that Indigenous people have here in Australia and to rethink how we might push along debates on the notion of evidence. So let me start with somebody to help provoke that discussion. <laughs> Uh, so there has been a resurgence in this notion of evidence uh, and evidence-based or evidence-informed policy making uh, for a little while now. We've been talking about alternative facts and uh, truthiness, all those kinds of concepts which are really, really challenging all of us to think about the role of experts and evidence. And uh, this kind of context is significant for us because in the literature, and I come from a background in public administration, public policy and political science, uh, I've worked as a practitioner in government as well as been in the academic space. Uh, we've become sort of immersed in a bit of a dead end set of debates between the value of science and the value of persuasion and storytelling. And we all know in practice and in academia from research that both of these are relevant. So that's kind of where we've now become at a bit of an impasse because we know they're both relevant but we don't quite know how to move things forward in terms of uh, making claims about the role of evidence in policy debate and in society. Now, my little plug for ANZO, which is where I work, so my post is at the University of Melbourne, but I'm 100% seconded to the Australia and New Zealand School of Government. And uh, these are four aspects that we do at ANZO in terms of trying to bridge uh, the role of theory and practice. And so we reach out through education, inspiration, connection, and enrichment uh, in the lives of practitioners who work in the policy space. And it's not just in the public sector, of course, because we know increasingly there are people working in the not-for-profit sector and in the private sector who actually work on public purpose projects. We are all increasingly engaged in things that advance society and not just uh, the profit making of an individual firm. So at ANZOG, we've started something of a little quiet revolution, if you like in terms of starting to acknowledge the role of the fact that we are an Australian and New Zealand School of Government. What does that mean? We are placed in Australia and New Zealand and we ought to be taking notice of what that means. So part of our role in ANZOG is to be starting to recognise all of the Indigenous nations across Australia and the Māori people in New Zealand to see what can they teach us about policy making and about evidence. So. In that regard, uh, one of the reasons why this is an exciting sort of area for us is because it taps into the notion of inclusion and diversity. Uh, we know from research as well that cognitive diversity is actually one of the most prized aspects of uh, any organisational firm in terms of actually trying to break through with new ideas and to create innovation. So that's part of the role of having inclusion and diversity because it actually promotes uh, cognitive diversity into teamwork and into processes. And increasingly in the leadership space, we know that people are starting to think beyond leadership being just from the head up. It's not just a cerebral exercise. Leadership is, in cases, the whole body. And the whole body is actually connect connected in place. So we know from leadership theory as well that this notion of inclusion and diversity is significant because we're not just talking about Western ways of doing leadership, we're talking about global ways of doing leadership and starting to recognise that there are civilizations across history who uh, have tapped into notions of leadership for many thousands of years and they have lots of important lessons to teach us. So in this regard we do have work such as that of Wolfgang Dressler, uh, who comes from Estonia, who's been really trying to draw out in the public administration arena, uh, what's the role of Islamic public administration or Confucian public administration? Uh, these are very significant uh, eras and civilizations who actually had extremely sophisticated government systems and unique ways of actually doing public administration that in some ways we've forgotten and left behind as we've moved towards prizing um, you know, United Nations, OECD, IMF, World Bank type approaches which prize Western ways of knowing and being. So how can we think about that in the Australian context? Well of course we've got some 220 different nations that we can identify within Australia, and that's a conservative sort of estimate. Um, just to give you a little map here from IATSIS, which you can tap into. Uh, so I mentioned before the 65,000 years worth of enduring civilization. This is the oldest civilization that we know in human history at this point. Um, so we've got a whole incredible array of governance structures, unique cultures, 
nations, traditions and languages, and they coexisted within Australia for a remarkably long period. So how did they do that? Uh, sadly, we've lost a lot of information, but there are processes underway where we're starting to reclaim uh, information about that and that we can learn from. So to give an example, I'm sure many of you would know within Indigenous culture the significance of land and the attachment to land. Uh, what you may not know is that in Indigenous governance, that connection to land is not just a uh, philosophical one, it's a tangible one, it's a cosmological one because Indigenous culture actually treats land as a relative, they are a real relative for Indigenous people. So Indigenous people across Australia actually didn't fight over land in times past. They had wars, they had fights, they had conflict. It was never over land because that was family. And you didn't fight over family. Uh, so that's probably a very unknown fact for many of us in terms of what we're taught. Uh, but that's quite an amazing insight in terms of how we might rethink how we shape our governance in Australia to allow a unique federation of some 220 nations to be able to coexist harmoniously and with an amazing amount of stewardship for the land uh, which enabled Australia to thrive for so long. If we think about this in terms of um, some of our modern approaches to knowledge, uh, there's a great book that I've put up here in terms of doing a comparison of Indigenous and Western ways of knowing and being in the science space. Uh, so the, the work there uh, is a range of authors and they are across a global kind of community. Um, I know it's very small print, but I'll make sure that the slide is available for people. It's basically a comparison to indicate points of similarity and uniqueness in the way that we do science, uh, traditionally in the Western approach, and how an Indigenous way of doing science can be done. A key difference, for example, would be the role of the community in an Indigenous approach to science and the approach to information uh, and intellectual property. So IP's sort of regimes are very different. Uh, in Indigenous cultures as opposed to how we think them, of them in Western approaches. Uh, but the role of the community is quite central and uh, there's also time frames. So usually within Indigenous cultures they'll talk about a seven generations principle. <coughs> so decision making is based not just on the immediacy of what might be needed at the moment but across a seven generation span. So if we think about that in a political context, very different from an election cycle as we know it. But that's why we've got a greater stewardship component going on in Indigenous cultures with respect to land because they're seriously thinking about many generations and the impact of a particular decision, not only on the current situation, but for all those living to come. Now, what does this mean for us if we are to actually take seriously the notion of an Indigenous concept of evidence? Um, how would policy be different? Because that's the important question, so what? Uh, we've got a, actually a whole range of different potential areas which can give an example of how policy could be different. And I'll just cite one within the time frame now which is related to land care management. So the University of Queensland has been partnering with um, uh, a number of in Aboriginal nations in Queensland uh, to look at spinifex grass. And uh, spinifex grass covers one third of the Australian continent, so it's a huge resource uh, as well as an aspect of our, our land. And what they've actually been able to do is to tap into uh, local indigenous knowledge about the resins contained in spinifex grass and to use that knowledge, match it up with uh, Western forms of modern science and they've now developed a new product which is basically like a nanoplastic. And it's being used in different ways of thinking about condoms, it's being used in different ways of thinking about um, gloved plastics for medical procedures and it's now creating a huge economic benefit. All the plastic industry is hugely excited and interested in this. And um, it wouldn't have been able to be done unless they'd actually had that knowledge coming from Indigenous communities. So that's a really good success story, if you like, of how we could think differently about the resource that we have at our disposal in the Australian context, if we actually take seriously that Indigenous people have something to give in terms of knowledge and different approaches uh, to thinking about what's going on in our country and our setting. Um, quickly, you might think about different notions of Koori Court and Indigenous um, <laughs> approaches to sentencing. That's some other experiments that are going on in Victorian context which have proven to be quite successful. Um, or there are other ways of thinking about evaluation. So the Mal Pereira example I've got there uh, would mean a different way of thinking about how we go about doing evaluation in terms of the processes and the sorts of evaluation results that we might actually achieve. And that's happening, for example, in the Northern Territory context. So there are actually a huge array 
are very practical examples where we can think about uh, tapping into Indigenous knowledge in new, exciting and innovative ways to the benefit of all. And it's with this in mind that I wanted to just uh, share this quote. It strikes me uh, I'm not Indigenous, but uh, I have been working in the space for about 15 years now and I've always benefited from a huge generosity and largesse of people and this is coming across the Canadian as well as the Australian uh, setting because I lived and worked over there as well and also New Zealand uh, where we're always being welcomed in uh, but too often we have just closed our eyes or our hearts in many instances to the possibilities there. So this quote uh, from David Moalaja I just put in there in terms of this notion of a gift it's not just for the Australian people. Um, we think that there's actually great benefit to come if we take seriously Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous ways of knowing and being as a new way of thinking about evidence. Um, the belief is that this could benefit not only Australia and New Zealand, but the whole world uh, in terms of a different approach to how we might govern ourselves and make decisions about ourselves as, as people and our communities and our land. So there are some cautions with some of this. Too often we've co-opted Indigenous knowledge uh, and used it uh, against Indigenous people. So we need to make sure that that doesn't continue to happen. Uh, some Indigenous knowledge is sacred and inaccessible. So for example, um, Aboriginal law. There's certain parts of Aboriginal law that we will never know and ought not to know. That's part of their sacred traditions and culture. Uh, so that should remain so. And also there's knowledge that knowledge ought not to be disembodied from the knower. That's a fundamental difference in a Western approach to knowledge. So it's going to require a bit of thoughtfulness and care and attention and a lot of mutual respect in terms of how we forge together a new path uh, about how we treat knowledge. So some conclusions. Um, the time is right for recognition of uh, other paradigms that might witness to the benefits of different civilizations and cultures in terms of how they view knowledge. And it's not just Indigenous, it's also, as I mentioned before, um, notions of Confucian or Eastern paradigms of public administration, uh, Islamic as well. Uh, and then how can we start to respect and identify distinctive ways of moving those conversations forward? Uh, it allows us to really think in different ways about evidence being connected with both facts and values. So that takes us back to that original uh, argument I made at the beginning that both science and storytelling or persuasion are relevant. So this enables us to tap into both of those elements because we can take some of the indigenous concepts of storytelling, for example, as a serious way of moving along our discussion about different facts. And hopefully it encourages us to break through, as I said before, and take this notion of uh, evidence in new directions and hopefully make a, a breakthrough in how we then govern ourselves. Thank you. Our third speaker in this session is Amanda Lawrence, who is the director of APO and is going to speak to us now. And after Amanda speaks, we'll have a short time for questions. Thanks, Derek. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, yeah, thanks uh, to Catherine and Lisa both for fabulous presentations. I got to go to a sunrise ceremony um, at uh, Alcatraz. Uh, oh, sorry, I put my mic on. Uh, just recently when I was in um, San Francisco and raised my hands to the sun coming up and it was really uh, very special. And I did reflect on how generous it was that, sorry. Can you hear me now? No? Uh, lapel mic or this mic? Uh, I did reflect on how generous it was that uh, they allowed me to and, and anybody who wanted to come to be part of that and, and that enormous generosity of that um, of, of Indigenous peoples in many places. Uh, so I wanted to talk about um, sort of leading on to various things that we've been talking about today, uh, but particularly uh, in pulling out from um, the idea of public knowledge, uh, trying to sort of think about what we consider publishing uh, these days. Is it not, it's still not loud enough? Great at the front. It's terrible at the back. Terrible at the back? Yes. It's better now. Um, I've got both the lapel mic and the, should I have just one or the other on? No, they're in sync. They're in sync? Yes? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, keep talking. So, um, so we all know that there is a problem with the intersection of research and public policy. Uh, and one reason for this, uh, certainly not the only reason, is the current state of the research publishing industry. Uh, publishing is a tool for communication. It's also big business. And the two uh, aspects of uh, these different models need to be understood. The formal scholarly and commercial system and the informal publishing communication system driven by organisations. In the case of the formal scholarly publishing, we have uh, an oligopoly of multinational publishing companies being handed the outputs of university researchers and others for free publication within a academic journals and books and then um, selling access to university libraries for a fortune, as we've heard earlier. Despite a long campaign for open access across the system, uh, it's entrenched and makes the majority of formal academic literature inaccessible to the wider community, including government. This is therefore a fairly obvious structural impediment for those outside academia to access and use research should they wish to do so. But I feel like we, 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 in, in a lot of the evidence-informed policy discussions, when we, we're still not really kind of coming back to this fundamental issue. On the other hand, we have a vast amount of uh, material being published by organisations, some of which is highly valued and very influential in public policy. Yet it's gen generally not actually recognised as uh, the large-scale massive communication and publishing system and economy that it is. Individual organisations produce content directly in a range of ad hoc ways that do not easily feed into large-scale publishing and library management systems. This allows for incre incredible flexibility in terms of production schedules, timing, content, creativity of form and style, uh, niche targeting of content and audience. Vastly uh, more options than just publishing in a, a journal article or a book. And these organisations can do this because the business model is totally different to commercial publishing. They're mission driven and publishing is a communication strategy, not the ultimate business strategy. Uh, so it's actually an ecosystem of organisations using publishing as a tool for communication. So we've got uh, media as we know, but then of course there's government itself, political parties, government departments and agencies, university research centres, so that's academics producing uh, research reports outside of journal publishing um, and, and many other ways of engagement as Lisa mentioned. Uh, a, hu a huge amount of publishing from NGO charities and advocacy groups, um, lobbyists and advisors, the think tanks, um, uh, consultants are increasingly being used and, uh, in, instead of academic uh, research, and of course industry bodies and advisors. So they, they're using research, they're producing it, um, they're commissioning it, it it's uh, a, a vast um, ecosystem. So I, I want to give an example sort of uh, of the Brookings Institute, um, which is a um, think tank based in Washington. And, and I think it, uh, you could look pretty much take the Grattan Institute or the Lowy Institute or, or many of the other think tanks or even some uh, academic research centres or, or other um, NGOs who, have, who would pretty much have gone through a similar process. So um, this is based on a talk by uh, David Nasser last year where he talked about how the Brookings Institute, Institution, which is a 100-year-old think tank, uh, serves the needs of policymakers in Washington, uh, was faced with the reality of digital disruption in the 21st century. Until 20, 2005, the Brookings Institute had maintained business as usual. They produced high-quality research and analysis, usually in the form of print or PDF publications and reports, and distributed this directly to government. They saw it as a B2B model, business to business. In 2005, with the rise of social media, they really felt that uh, this whole model was um, coming unstuck. Uh, not only were there more producers in the field, but government and the public could go directly to the source. Social media could, could be used to distribute and disseminate um, documents and publications and all sorts of information and it was much harder to get heard, it was much harder to prove that you were credible um, and they were in a bit of a crisis. From 2012 the Brookings Institute uh, became what NASA called a publisher. They actually saw themselves in a different light from being a think tank to actually being a publisher. 
It was not an easy transition. It required scholars willing to adopt the new model, extra budget, new kinds of expertise in-house. They hired a bunch of creative talent to produce blogs, infographics, videos, briefings, immersive storytelling, um, and long-form interactive essays. They even created uh, a game, The Fiscal Ship, where you can go in and uh, see you know, what, what will happen uh, with different kinds of budget lines and so on. Um, so they uh, really sort of ad adopted uh, an engagement and publishing strategy. It's, he said it's taken a while for them to be seen as a publisher and I think this is the, the, the nub of the problem for all of us to recognise that actually any organisation engaged in this kind of production is now a publisher. Um, and many inside and outside Brookings didn't accept that they're a publisher and this has made it, it difficult, also difficult with audiences and difficult with uh, its relationship with the media. Um, it sees itself as a uh, publisher not only in terms of content production but in terms of a business model. Uh, according to David, what is innovative in a business model shift of a hundred year old organisation from an inward facing university without students to a cutting edge publishing pile of house? So they are now a B2C, a business to consumer. Uh, as a not-for-profit organisation, they're supported by donations. They're a kind of like a media company, but without the restrictions of a modern-day publisher. They still need the media, but they do not need to rely on external filters for distribution, So, which is also the case with all the many organisations that I described before. Unlike uh, the, the peer review system and the, and, the pub and the book publishing system, you know, you, if you can produce something, if you can find the money to do it, you can, you can produce it and put it out there. Um, that doesn't necessarily make, say, it's it better or worse quality. Um, so the business model is not a traditional one of either retail or subscription sales. In fact, often there is no cost for the consumer or large or target audience, and therefore it's not being seen part of the publishing industry. We need to make it explicit as a model to be able to see the economics and the influence of this hidden industry and also to understand how we're going to manage it. It's a system of production with many players involved, producing an array of uh, diverse sources. Um, and some, ac some uh, various uh, academics uh, are thinking about this, as we heard earlier from Howard. So there's um, an understanding of some kind of hierarchy of dissemination. So many people, at, uh, many uh, academics as well as other organisations are looking at a whole vast array of published materials. But writing and editing, design, communication strategies, marketing, distribution systems, standards and storage and archival management are what publishers do. And I think we have perhaps underestimated the difficulties of doing all these skills and the trade that is publishing. This doesn't mean that we can't all become publishers, in fact we are, but we are perhaps underestimated uh, the ways in which we need to do this well and the underlying information systems and infrastructure that we need in order to be able to actually have long-term access and management to, of this material. Systems and standards have grown up around uh, the publishing industry because they benefit business. But this has locked us into a very narrow concept of what is a publication and who does publishing. There's a massive industry of these non-journal publishers using the same tools for communication. Um, so perhaps I, I, uh, I've struggled to sort of find the language, but perhaps we have publisher publishing, which is not very good, organisation publishing, and personal publishing as a, as a way of uh, actually sort of distinguishing something around what's going on in this area. Um, so we need to think about the, um, the systems and the standards and the management of these ma materials for the long term, which is... Um, where, uh, so just to, uh, sorry, um, so this is some uh, research that we did uh, a couple of years ago and uh, did a survey of what uh, resources people valued working in the public, um, government, NGOs, education sector, and to, to just sort of show that although journal articles are, are appreciated, the diversity of other materials that people really value and uh, often have found it incredibly difficult to find and filter. Which brings me to APO, of course. Uh, so 
Um, sometimes it may seem to, uh, from the outside, it, it can often be quite difficult to explain what is APO and why it exists, which is uh, why my uh, long story about publishing, because it, we, unless we actually understand the massive amount of publishing that is going on in the informal sector, and that it is seriously informing government all the time, and, and is also produced by government, and government is a terrible manager of its own material, we, it's hard to justify the money that we need to uh, invest in, in a database such as APO, or the a whole underlying public knowledge infrastructure that um, we also need to invest in. So APO was established in 2002 really to be an alert service um, and over time we've really focused more and more on um, being not only an alert service, and I'm sure many of you uh, would, would be subscribed to that as an alert service, but also to be the underlying repository and uh, long-term manager of this sort of content. So far at the moment we've got 40,000 resources, 6,000 organisations, which gives you a sense of uh, already the scale of um, of going on, what's going on, and that's still mainly Australia, New Zealand, but um, some international organisations, but we really haven't uh, tapped into uh, the international market yet at all. Uh, and 26,000 authors with a million page views every year. So our audience, um, it's, it's heavily used by government, although they're not, uh, well, through the Australian Research Council, they fund us, but uh, not through any other means. Um, uh, education sector, the not-for-profit sector, and uh, to some extent commercial organisations. Great, thanks. Um, so we are both uh, a, a database and an alert service, as I mentioned. And I just, uh, I think sometimes it's not really clear the, uh, the, the investment that we make in the, in the plumbing of uh, information infrastructure that we uh, create. So. When, you're, when you see a, a, a publication or you publish on APO, you're getting a fully catalogued um, record. We, uh, your title, author, which could have an ORCID ID, which is part of the identification of researchers around the community. Um, we have uh, full uh, interoperable metadata, uh, controlled subject vocabularies using a, a vocabulary developed by um, OCLC which is one of the largest library organisations in the world. And I'm now part of a, a group working with the British Library and Harvard Library, looking at how do we um, create that vocabulary in a way that's actually um, able to be used around the world uh, and then potentially translated into other languages. And um, uh, we can mint DOIs, a DOI is a digital object identifier, which then means that we can connect our content up with say data or, or you know if we've got a publication so we're working on that at the moment in a project with the Australian Data Archive to be able to connect say a, a, Hild, a, a, a report about um, the Hilda survey which I'm sure many of you are familiar with with the actual <coughs> data that that survey um, that that report is comes from. Um, we feed into alt metrics we provide metrics of our own um, and we do a lot of collection building so now that we've got that collection, uh, the, the database, we can actually start to create bespoke collections for partners who want to be able to uh, bring together the resources in a certain area. So one of the, um, uh, Howard was talking about systematic reviews. If you're going to use some of this um, you know, organisation publishing in a systematic review, it's really difficult because there aren't big databases of this material. So APO uh, has the potential as, as we expand to uh, create those sorts of collections that we can actually use uh, to systematically analyse the evidence base, whether it's persuasion or, or re, you know, um, fully vetted research. Uh, yeah, pretty much out of time, great. Um, so uh, I just, uh, you've probably all seen this before, but this is our LEAF project. Um, Amir will talk a little bit more about the technical things, but I guess my point is that in order to do these sorts of exciting projects, you've really got to have the underlying metadata and, and, and structure uh, to go ahead. And through the special collections that we've been doing, it's an example of where we can you know, uh, massively expand in particular areas through, um, through the collection funding. Um, and yeah, that's 
that's what I reckon. That's pretty much sums it up. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. We've got time for a couple of questions. So if anybody would like to ask a question, please um, wait for the microphone thingy and then ask your question. Say who you are first. Yep, two questions over there. Yeah, sorry, this is very embarrassing. I must, um, I'm a recent graduate from the University of Melbourne, so this is very exciting for me. I'm very happy to see a lot of um, uh, professional women that I could look up to and hopefully be part of future. I don't know. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was very thrilled to hear about the discussion and indigenous perspectives in policy because I was actually having this very interesting discussion with my partner before about how Western concepts of international relations and public policy have created this sort of um, fear in how the uh, the changing global landscape of countries, you know, how China is becoming increasingly um, influential. There's created this whole fear, but I think it's probably because of the whole um, Western approach to international relations, where there's a lot of um, uh, uh, there's a lot of fear going on about what has happened before could potentially happen again. And he has shared that in many uh, in the Japanese. Uh, psyche, Buddhism really looks at how a person is a part of nature, so you have no no position to take advantage of another another object as yours because you do not have any position to own it. So I thought that was very interesting how you shared a similar perspective in indigenous culture where no matter how many people fight over a certain area, it's not really about ownership of land, but more of about, uh, it's a different, it's a different concept, I think. So I just wanted to share that. It's not really a question, I just wanted to share that. It was a very interesting insight. Thank you. We had another question right next to you. Sorry, I, I feel like I'm asking, this is my second question, so apologies right. for that, but I also wanted to pick up on the presentation about Indigenous knowledge and perhaps ask each of the speakers to think about that question of seven generations. How does that relate to your presentation? What would you like to see? Or thinking about seven generations, what could it mean for what you are asking us to think about? Yeah, that's... Um well, actually, I think that is one of the reasons why we need to um, provide a uh, public knowledge infrastructure and actually think about it as um, public knowledge infrastructure in some way. So can you hear that? No. Um, no? No. Uh, yeah. yeah. Is that better? Maybe I'll just swallow it. No, I've got a lapel. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. Is that, just can you hear me now? Yeah. Just put it high. Oh, I just hold it. That's fine. Uh, yeah. So I mean, we are. We this people talk about a digital black hole. Uh, so the the seven generations that we invested in uh, in say the eighteen fifties or you know earlier in in the public library system. Uh, where is that idea now? And we really need to revisit that in order to be able in seven generations that the the policy documents that. In, are informing, say, indigenous policy, but or everything, are uh, actually accessible to future generations. Um, oh, I think I've got mine on. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, I suppose it's really what resonates is always whose knowledge are we privileging? And that's, you know, I think, uh, even as I was looking at the, the book and that breakdown of cable, which I do want to slide later, yeah. I was going, you know, there are lots of folks in academe who are perhaps not indigenous, not doing indigenous research, but boy, have we moved on that spectrum already from Western side. When I did my PhD, I was told explicitly, you can't just do a qualitative. So I did a mixed methods. It had quant, it had textual analysis, it had qual. Now, students in my discipline can purely do qual. There is an evolution. So I think you know we do see change, it is possible. <coughs> 
Um, but I made the comment to someone over tea today, you know, we still had in Howard's talk the notion that an RCT is the gold standard. You know, I think those notions are shifting. We now have works about qualitative systematic reviews. There are ways to do narrative, right? So uh, to me, that's what resonates, and that's um, not um, solely an indigenous issue, if you will, but I think there's lots that we can learn from indigenous ways of knowing that influence all of our work around research. I think I would sort of echo uh, the previous person who made a comment as well, just that notion of uh, seven generations, <laughs> I'd love to see more respect for all knowledge and a more holistic approach to knowledge, because I think there is movement, but we have siloized so much knowledge, uh, and we, we, we're talking about similar things across disciplines, but we don't talk to each other. And so we're missing out on the enrichment that we all have to bring through our different knowledge backgrounds, our different um, you know, human backgrounds, and then our place and time in history as well. So uh, uh, my hope would be that uh, you know, for seven generations we'd be more respectful, more holistic, and connected. Thank you. Did, we've got time for one more question. One. Yep. Sorry, my second question too. Um, hi, my name is Katie. I'm from the Parliamentary Library, Victoria. I work in the research service there. Um, I'd just like the panel's views on what you think about platforms like The Conversation, which aim to connect researchers directly with the community. Uh, so, conversation is great. Um, I think anything that can promote that uh, more improved connection between theory and practice is, is the better. Uh, so, the ability to make sure, if you think about that concept of evidence as well, um, having robust uh, approaches to you know, information uh, that's credible, uh, but is connected to application and what people are looking for in terms of impact as well, uh, the more we can be doing that, the better. Yeah, I, I agree, um, especially now that it's really a worldwide platform and we, you know, we've got reach that we wouldn't otherwise get. Um, and I finally got around to doing my first conversation piece just about a month or so ago. I keep telling myself I will do more. Um, but I think my experience is, like many academics, it's very difficult to find the time to do that. It's, it, uh, again, it's not part of the reward structure. So I feel quite privileged that I can take the time, I can make those choices. Junior academics not necessarily you know, are free to, to do that. And I continue to encounter people who will say outright, that's a waste of time. Why are our people wasting their time writing these things? They should be focusing on a Q1 journal. Um, and as much as I also want staff to focus on Q1 journals, uh, because they have their place, we've got to figure out the balance of where does the conversation fit. So I'm a huge advocate, but um, I think we've got a long way to go to provide support and training to staff that just know how to write for the conversation. They've got to make pitches to editors. How do we get the word out? A lot of it's still very STEM driven. I'm very worried that our HASP disciplines get a bit lost in the shuffle, even in the conversation. So watch this space. Uh, yes, I think um, it's important to, I, I see the conversation as part of the media industry and, and uh, because some people have often said, oh, what's the difference between an APO and a conversation? And I think, well, they're totally different. Why would you even <laughs> ask that? You know, it's a bit like saying, what's the difference between APO and The Age or The Guardian? You know? uh, so it, it's, it's taken that model, it's, um, and, I, and I think it's fantastic. And it's actually uh, part of what Karen Mallet was talking about of, uh, you know, it, it's one example of the evol evolving nature of journalism. Uh, it's reliant very much on income from universities, and uh, as is APO. And, and there's certain kind of you know structural problems around. It's almost like universities being the last uh, institution standing, apart from government, that has any money. Um, but it's worth thinking about, well, you know, that money, you know, that, I think that's why we need to think of things systematically a bit more. A lot of that money is coming from international students. International students are basing their assessment of university on uh, impact factor and a research factor. That's based on the publication in A-star journals. 
uh, which then means that you know teachers are uh, not being able to you know, you know really focus on teaching because they need to write articles for ASI journals and and where does that money come from for promotion you know uh, so anyway it's it's a trickle down effect that I think is um, problematic and I don't know how long that will last so I'm just wondering how long uh, this sort of system such as APO and the conversation will always be able to rely on the funds coming from universities because universities are also being disrupted and um, yeah it's, it's, it's an interesting times and we, I think we really need to think about where the funds come from to support this type of access to knowledge and translation. Thank you Amanda for the last word and <laughs> to the three of our speakers for doing their part to connect research to public policy. Thank you.